third phase of moon. Ron Gardner, who is the producer of the website www.area51jrod.com, he is actually in the secret government. He knows who the MJ-12 members are. He's got some seriously good information that the whole world needs to hear. Uh, Mr. Ron Gardner, pleasure to have Hello. you. Hello, good to talk to you this evening. Uh, we are on the line with Blake Cousins as well. Blake, you have anything okay. you want to ask him before I jump into some of these questions I got for you? Sure. Sure thing. Mr. Gardner, um, I know with all your research over the many years you've been investigating the phenomenon and your insight to, you know, what's going on in the secret government. Can you tell our listeners right, you know, from the beginning, let's get to Area 51. The bodies, that's good, are they... That's a, that's a good idea. That's where everything is. It's really important. It's Area 51 S4, though. It's not Area 51 proper. That's what people get mixed up about that. S4 is where they take all the hot stuff. It's about 15 miles southwest of Groom Lake proper in uh, Papoose Mountain. It's five different levels, and uh, those levels are uh, where all they keep all the super secret stuff. The, the craft are there. There's nine craft there. The uh, ET people, both live and dead, are there. Uh, Dr. Dan Burry, who's the main thrust of what I've been researching for the last 10 years, worked there on and off uh, for 10 years. Uh, your listeners probably know about Bob Lazar. Uh, Bob Lazar worked there maybe three and a half months, so the big difference there. But uh, as a journalist and a documentary filmmaker, when I interview people, I make sure that I have at least two and preferably three corroborations. Uh, so with the Dan Burrish and the Bob Lazar and Bill Uhouse, the three people who actually worked at Area 51 S4, so I have that cooperation uh, from all three of them. I have them on my videos. I, I've interviewed Dr. Dan Burrish for over 100 hours on camera. I've interviewed him 100 hours off camera. He's almost like my stepson. I've been involved with this story. I've two books that I've written, and a third one with his parents. So I know what's in Area 51. I know uh, why the people are there and how long they've been there. I know all of that. So I always mention to UFO researchers to target your UFO freedom of information at Area 51 S4. That's where the, the uh, tissue samples of the ET people are. That's where all the films are. That's where all the audio is. Uh, they have hundreds of hours of our scientists working with uh, the particular one that I'm focusing on is J-Rod, J-Rod. That's a code name that the uh, military people gave this particular being who uh, crash-landed near Kingman, Arizona in 1953. There were either three or four beings that were on the ship I think it was three, but I've heard four. Uh, two or three of them were taken to were taken to Los Alamos, but the one that I'm focusing on here, uh, that particular J Rod was taken to Area 51 S4. He was kept captive there for over 50 years, and at the at the uh, fifth level down at Area 51 S4 under Papoose Mountain. Now, uh, I can flesh that out more. Do you have any questions you want to pose at this point, or uh, should I just continue? You know, actually, I, I, you, we, before we were talking, you mentioned a difference between aliens and ETs, extraterrestrials. Can you tell all the listeners about that? Yes, I'd be happy to. Uh, the main difference, or the difference, is that uh, when Dr. Dan Burries talks about extraterrestrials, he said, I never met an alien, but I have met an extraterrestrial. I ask him a hundred times, what's the difference? And his response is that the ET person is a real person. It's a person from the future. It has a very similar genome to humans alive today. Uh, you know, two arms, two legs, a uh, large head, uh, wrap around eyes and so forth. But a alien, from his point of view, and now my point of view, because I, I'm uh, focusing on what he says, is a being from another star system that has no genetic linkage to the human race. 
I don't know if you have that image from the Virginia case. There, there's an actual, from my humble import, uh, you know, opinion that that's an actual alien. It has it's it has the red eyes, uh, has protuberances on the head, and uh, I went there six years ago with Dr. Roger Lear to try and interview the orthopedic surgeon that operated on that what I consider an alien. Uh, because <clears throat> Dr. Roger Lear had talked to this particular orthopedic surgeon prior to our going down there, and at that time, the first interview, he said that this that there was tissue samples taken. There was uh, he had a broken leg, so there was uh, actual X-rays of the being. And so, on my long list of things to do, I want to compare the genome of that what we call an alien. Uh, in the Virginia case, which is like the, the Roswell of Brazil, it's a major case. I've written a book on it. I've got a documentary uh, with Dr. Roger Lear. And compare that genome with the genome of the J-Rod. On my site right now, uh, area51jrod.com, right at the top, you can see uh, it says Q94 document. Well, that Q94 document, is Dr. Dan Burish, uh, one of the best microbiologists on the planet. Uh, the Q stands for his, cure, his clearance, his security clearance, and 94 is when he wrote that, that particular document. And that document was leaked to someone on the inside of Area 51S4 out to Dr. Burish's now wife, Marcia McDowell. And uh, then she leaked it to Bill Hamilton. Bill Hamilton and I were researching Area 51. He gave me that information. So that document is on my site. You can download it. And I'm hoping at some point that um, uh, that we can actually compare these two. The particular scientist in Brazil is reluctant to come forward. But uh, Dr. Roger Lear and I have sort of a, a game plan that we may be able to get that information. Uh, that being... Uh, crashed in, in Brazil in 1996, and uh, there was at least two and maybe three creatures there. Uh, in Brazil, the fire department is a part of the military. It isn't separated like it is here. So the fire department captured one of these aliens in a net and put it in a box on the back of their truck. The military rolls up uh, with the guns and say, we want to take control of it, which they did and took it to a small hospital near where they were that wasn't adequate, and they took it to a major hospital. And uh, when they took the, the being into the operating room, because it had a, a major compound fracture, the military put guards both on the inside of the door and the outside of the door. And uh, major things happened within the room. Uh, the room sort of filled with a green mist, uh, the orthopedic surgeon set the uh, the compound fracture with the being and had kind of a download of information. I don't have exactly what the being said to the orthopedic surgeon, but Dr. Rear has some Dr. Lear has some of that information. And the the uh, the military people that were there just told the orthopedic surgeon he just said fix it. Just a demand. And, of course, the orthopedic surgeon didn't know what this was all about. It came out later. and But the, the being healed itself. It took about 24 hours, and the bone totally healed itself. They had that capability. So that, that that's an alien. Now, I can tell you more about the J-Rod, which is uh, part of the human family in the future. And that's a major part of this story, which most people don't get. When you see these UFOs flying around... They're flying time machines. They warp space-time. And yeah. that's why when people fire at them, uh, there's no result because you're, you're going into another dimension, and that dimension uh, nullifies whatever armaments that we shoot at them. No, that's a theory that I believe in, that they, these flying saucers, these aliens, are you know, maybe humans from the future traveling back in time to visit you know, our present day. I want to ask you a couple of questions. Let's start with this one. Why do you think they named the alien J dash rod? Why did they name him that you said? 
Yes. Any maybe uh, you know reasoning behind yeah, that? The, the, the code name. Yeah, it's uh, when uh, this particular uh, his real name is Kealau. Uh, that was held secret for a long time, but now it's out. His real name is Kealau. And when he crashed near Kingman, Arizona in 1953, uh, the military has a unit called the Sigma Unit. And these are linguists and psychologists that are able to interact with these beings that come here. And so they are able to uh, translate whatever language the beings uh, project to the humans and, you know, back and forth. So in the, in the initial stages, the J-Rod pointed to the tenth letter on the keyboard, which is J, and also pointed to a bar code, which is uh, just a bar, which is an Egyptian Mayan symbol for five. So naturally, whenever a human talks to another human, where are you from? Well, I'm from Kansas City. I'm from New York. Well, so they ask this particular being, where are you from? And he said 15, 10, and 5 through 15, 15 light years from uh, planet Earth, and his home base was on Zeta Reticuli, which ties in and corroborates the Betty of Barney Hill story, because they, the beings that uh, abducted Betty and Barney Hill said the same thing. And uh, Betty Hill, uh, when she was hypnotized and given... Um, instructions to uh, explain uh, where this being was from, and another woman constructed a 3D image of it, and she didn't know astronomy, and, and lo and behold, they found out that this existed. And this uh, uh, Zeta Reticuli, there's, there's two, the binary star system. So uh, then there's, a, there's, I'm told by my research, that there is like a there's a halfway point between Zeta Reticuli and planet Earth. There's like a jump gate there, so they assemble there, and then come to Earth. So uh, I know people that study this um, are it's very controversial about this, and that, because that's what most people say. They're so far away they can't get here. Well, Michio Kaku has said on numerous occasions that don't oh, wait a minute. They can fold space time. It isn't a linear uh, journey. And uh, there's a wonderful TV program called Wormholes and uh, Sliders. And so Hollywood's gotten on board this thing. I'm really pleased with that because they're conditioning the people about how these beings travel uh, Earth time and come here. And they're coming here in droves. I only know of four for sure. But the literature has 57 or, you know, maybe 100 and some on. But I can only, uh, from my information, uh, address the four that I know about. You know, and, Ron, Ron yeah, I wanted ahead. to ask you about some of the technology that we received. Obviously, this boom of technology in civilian hands could can be attributed to, you know, ET crashes and what we've done with them. I wanted to ask you what the difference between yellow book and looking glass. And before I do that, also, I heard a, a nice theory that says we did find weapons of mass destruction when we went to Iraq, but it wasn't nuclear or chemical weapons. It was actually Project Looking Glass, which could be a Stargate. Can you tell our listeners about that? Uh, yes, I can. What the Dr. Burrish has told me, it's in my videos, it's on the website in the stored store area, is that when uh, Saddam Hussein was creating all the problems, um, I don't know if people really noticed, but uh, where the green zone is, Saddam Hussein had created a theme park there, a Sumerian theme park with all kinds of structures. Uh, and what I'm told from my research is that he had uh, uh, devices that could uh, actually teleport people from different one dimension to another. It's not the, the the looking glass proper. The looking glass has that capability, uh, but this is a different kind of device. And when our, if the, your listeners will realize, when our military uh, units went into Iraq in fifty in uh, ninety three. I mean, at 103, uh, the first place they went to was the Baghdad Museum. 
and they didn't blow the doors. They had actual explosives. I mean, they had key, actually had keys. They didn't have. They didn't need explosives. And we wanted to get those devices that Saddam Hussein had stored there, because our that's one of the big things that's going on. We had to disassemble uh, these devices because there's as our uh, solar system goes through the plane of the galactic, it triggers certain things in the dust cloud. So uh, we found out that Saddam Hussein had given some of this technology to Muammar Gaddafi. So our military went to and talked to Muammar Gaddafi and said, uh, you know, those things that Saddam gave you, well, you saw what happened to him. We'll forgive you what happened at Lockerbie 800 and make you richer than you could ever imagine, but you need to give us that that uh, those devices. And Gaddafi, he was a very smart person and, and handed it over. So uh, that's, that's back during, Wait, you know, Ron, during the... Wait, we are going on a break. All you listeners out there, stay tuned. We'll be right back in a short minute just to take continue where we are. That's right. We are back live on air, third phase of Moon Radio here on Revolution Radio. Uh, just before we continue on with our guest, just a reminder for everybody, next week, next Thursday, 516, we have Yvonne Smith, the 23rd, Robert Salas, the 30th, Dr. Greer. Also, make sure you check out uh, Alien Human Project, a feature-length film on Dr. Lear, produced by the Cousins Brothers and myself, yours truly, on Third Phase of Moon at YouTube. And our guest, Ron Gardner, has a disclosure website. Everybody out there listening, check it out. It's www.area51jrod.com. Area51jrod.com. Now, uh, Mr. Gardner, right before yes. we uh, went to the break, we were talking about how Saddam gave the technology to Gaddafi and how we went to Gaddafi and told him to, uh, look what happened to Saddam. Can we pick That's up right. where we left <laughs> off? Yeah, he, he, was, he, was, he was pretty smart in that way. Um, yeah, but your listeners or viewers, if they can go to my website and check out the J-Rod EBE, there's a link to it and explains it in great detail. Uh, but I like to, we could continue with this part of it, but I think we need to, uh, address Area 51 a little bit more because that's where, uh, I'm going to have, I don't have it right now, I have some of it. I'll have actual 3D depictions of the most secret part of the most secret base in the world. Now, I, I've, I've uh, been studying this subject for over 30 years. And I've been working with this Dan Burry story for 10 years. So I'm amazed that I've gotten all this information. So what that means to the ufological community is that people on the inside want this information out. Otherwise, I wouldn't have all this information. I wouldn't have 3D depictions of the most secret part of the base. So, uh, you know, Bob Lazar, when he came out, I was in Las Vegas when he got that first interview in 89, that's what really ginned up my interest in Area 51 because uh, I knew that uh, I knew John Lear is a good friend of mine, and he absolutely backed everything that Bob Lazar said. So I know in UFO communities they uh, kind of look askance at uh, Bob Lazar, but he he was right on the money. Uh, no, I want to so, ask you. I want to ask you, Ray, about these 3D uh, renditions. Would we be able to uh, get the material from you, you know, some products so we could, you know, get it out to third phase of viewers uh, worldwide? How are you going to be able to? Uh, well, you know, the, it, it can be. We, we, ha we have to convert it. I have some of it uh, ready to go. I haven't put it up on the site yet. But uh, that's a possibility in the future. Yes, we can do this. That would be and, absolutely amazing. I want to get back to, uh, you know, J-Rod again. I feel sorry for the you know, the bean himself. Let me ask you, he was in prison. Yeah, I, do, I do too. I felt sorry for him. How was he treated at area 51? Was he treated like a criminal or was, uh, or was he continuously, uh, you know, as an abductee would have to go through a lot of traumatic experience being uh, probed and things along these lines. Did they, basically they reversed it on him? Well, the, he actually came here he was from Zeta Reticuli as a sacrificial lamb. He came here to have his genomic structure changed because he had a neuropathy disease. It's very painful. A friend of mine has had it. And so he came here so that our scientists could change his genome 
which will then change us in the future and we won't have this terrible disease. Now, they weren't totally successful. They were partially successful. and But they kept him on the fifth level down in below Papoose Mountain and he called himself captive because that's what the that's what how he felt because uh he wasn't allowed to uh to interact with his fellows if they came to visit him and so forth and he had to have uh a special atmosphere his normal oxygen and nitrogen but with about a five percent extra hydrogen because his lungs needed that extra hydrogen to function so they had him there. He was interrogated. Uh, our military called him names, called him Stumpy and Bright Eyes, and sort of made fun of him. And But the main thing that really irritates me is that they would not allow him to have clothes. Now, think of Abu Ghraib and, you know, what what's happening in Guantanamo. Uh, our military mindset is, is just, uh, I just can't understand it. He wanted to wear clothes, but he wasn't allowed to. But that allowed Dr. Dan Burrish, when he was taking the over 300, or nearly 300 tissue samples in the 94-95 time frame, they were able, he was able to actually see the genitalia of this being, which I have that up on my site. I have a drawing of uh, the, the J-Rod's uh, genitalia. Now, nobody has that information. Uh, they had internal fertilization. They, uh, you know, had elimination similar to humans. Well, the only thing is they had to, they had to be hydrated. They were drinking liquid all the time. So that was a, a, a major part of the way they were uh, handling him. And uh, when Dr. Burish, uh, I need to get into this because this explains a lot. In 95, he had been working with this J-Rod for two years, uh, taking tissue samples. He had a special pins gun that the tissue sent. It's on my site. All of this, you can see this on my site. And the tissue would be extracted from the nerve uh, of the upper appendage of the uh, J-Rod person. So for the, in 95, after two years of interacting, for the first time in two years, the J-Rod took a step toward Dr. Dan Burris the military microbiologist. This shocked Dr. Burris. He considered him a friend, but at the same time, that movement uh, startled him. He stepped back, caught his heel on the graded floor of the clean sphere, and at the top of my site, you can see a, a, the 3D drawing of the clean sphere. And the J-Rod didn't jump on him, but he sort of waddled over to him and climbed up on his chest and downloaded all this information into Dr. Dan Burris' crane Burris was his name, uh, uh, Crane was his given name at birth. He's gone back to that. And so the military people at Area 51 S4 kind of joked that, that uh, the J Rod downloaded the Galactic Encyclopedia into Dr. Man Burris. And so people say, well, what, what was a part of that? And part of it was a book that he wrote, Dr. Dan Burris wrote a book called Egos Disobey, Inca City, which was all about a city on Mars. So uh, in our future, we're going to Mars. I know uh, President Obama said we're not going to, but according to my information, and we are going to Mars, and maybe we're even there now. That's a whole other discussion, which I, I'm not ready to talk about. But, you know, Ron, you have a lot of information on your site. We want all the listeners out there <laughs> to, to check it out. But, you know, after this Blake's going to do a great little movie on Third Phase of the Moon where everybody's going to be able to see this. Can we showcase the world what's on your site on Third Phase of the Moon? Uh, yeah, you can put your site up. Uh, I've been uh, tasked to, to get this information out. Dr. Dan Burry is the... No, no, we're workers. saying we're going to put it on our channel. We'll show, we'll show pages from your site and, of course, offer everyone links to, to your site. Sure. No, that's fine. No, that, that's my job. I was holding off putting my site up. It just went up this week. I had to wait till after the citizens' hearing was over. Uh, there are certain protocols that I had to adhere to, but now, yeah, I want to blast this to the world, so you guys are welcome to it. 
Good, good. All you listeners out there, make sure you check out Area51JRod.com and also Third Phase of Moon on YouTube where you can see all the great footage, including this interview, and you'll be actually seeing what we're talking about. We have a UFO hunter, Joe Kiernan, who was on the last hour with us. He has a, a question for you, Gardner. Okay. Ron Gardner. Yeah. Joe? Yes, hello. Uh, thank you for uh, taking the time to answer a question for me. I'm happy uh, to, Joe. Uh, so many good questions were already covered, and I know you, you know the topic very well. But just to quickly ask a question you were just on a minute ago. When you were saying, J-Rod, he needed, they required drinking a lot of liquids. Right. What was the liquid? Was it primarily water? Was it strictly Primarily water. water. Yeah, primarily water as far as I know. Uh, and it was just, that was that their overall, uh, th their means of uh, nutrition? No, there was other nutrition. I never asked Dr. Burish about that because uh, the clean sphere was lifted up from what they call the ambassadorial suite, which was on a lower level where they took care of the J-Rod. Uh, but they're always concerned about contamination. Dr. Burish and the other uh, military uh, scientists had to wear what they call a totally encapsulated suit. It's a space suit when they were interacting with the J-Rod. Uh, if, you, uh, if you see my site at the top of it, you can see actual drawings of this. Uh, because we didn't want to, yeah, we didn't, we, we didn't, fantastic. we didn't want to contaminate the the extraterrestrial, and we didn't want him to contaminate us. So all all these fifty years, he's been isolated, uh, and uh, all the people that interacted with him had to do it in uh, these totally encapsulated suits. Now, this brings up something I just want to mention. We mentioned the Parginia case. Uh, when Dr. Lear and I went to Parginia, we interviewed a woman whose husband was a military uh, policeman who, ca who had, had actually carried this being in the patrol car. And he died like six, um, six weeks later, bleeding from every orifice in his body because he was contaminated. So that shows there this other creature in Brazil in 96 uh, that it was dangerous for humans to interact. So that's why uh, th that's a corroboration for me that what I know about the, the J-Rod here, they were very concerned. It was like the Andromeda strain. I use that. Dr. Burry mentions two films all the time, his Andromeda strain and the um, uh, Dustin Hoffman movie Outbreak. If you want to know what Area 51 S4, uh, the bottom levels look like, this go watch uh, Outbreak with Dustin Hoffman, and you'll, it's very similar. The ramps, the the way they, they, they isolate the being and everything is very similar to that movie. I want to ask you about the Eisenhower possible attempt of overtaking Area 51 with the uh, U.S. military. <laughs> okay, well, uh, you're jumping to a different topic there now. <laughs> well, there was uh, some uh, you know mention of that just recently out of the Citizen hearing. What Have you heard anything about that? Yeah, so I'm the one that brought that particular witness to uh, the hearing. I, I've written a book about him, and I've interviewed him and his family for 15 years. And this, and the code name Stein, he doesn't want his name known. He's quite ill. Did you see the clip of him at the citizens' hearings? Yes, I did. Uh, the interview with uh, Richard Dolan, absolutely yeah. incredible. Yeah, I'm, I'm the one that set all that up. Well, I would have to say that was a very well uh put together presentation i was uh, fascinated through the whole thing and i want to ask you how did you come across uh, the ex-cia um retiree to come forward and how did uh you know how did the whole collaboration work well i need to go back a little bit a little more history uh in 1983 i was working for a mortgage company in beverly hills and the woman manager and i went to lunch one day and she said that her brother worked at area 51 I said, oh, really? I'd love to talk to him. So uh, she said, yeah, well, she could set it up. Every time I tried to set up a meeting with her brother, he said there was a white van with a dish on top cruising his neighborhood, so he would never, I could never set up an appointment. But what he told her and told me on the phone was that when he was a low-level person in Area 51, he wasn't, you know, he was a, a welder or something, and he would go by this one office and there was this being in there and the office was all disheveled with books everywhere and this guy had one blue sock and one brown sock 
So her brother went in there one day and told this person, why don't you clean this place up? It's a mess. And this being said verbatim, look, fellow, I just put on this body every day, just like you put on your coveralls, so get out of here and leave me alone. So that was my first in 83. And then the Bob Lazar happened in 89. So then uh, Bill Hamilton was one of the major researchers. He and I were close friends. And we, whenever we get together, I worked in Beverly Hills, and he worked as a computer specialist at UCLA, so we would meet in Westwood to talk about all these UFO stories that we were researching. And so uh, that's how I came in contact with Dr. Burris and the J-Rod. At the same time, I produced a radio show uh, in San Diego on Truth Seeker Radio, and one of the people that were part of the Truth Seeker organization uh, was the son-in-law of the CIA agent. And so uh, he told me about <clears throat> his father-in-law, and so I began researching that uh, for 15 years. I, I've only come out with this in the last month, uh, but I vetted his whole family, and him, I've seen the documentation of his uh, working both uh, as in the Army as a cryptographer and working for the CIA at the same time. That's quite often true with the CIA people. They wear two hats, and um, they use code names, and that's that, that's that old story. So I, I first be, first became aware of this particular individual uh, in 97 time frame. Then I contacted Linda Howe. You remember what she said at the hearing? That she had interviewed him? Well, I'm the one that set all that up. And then I set it up with Richard Dolan for February the 5th of this year. And so I have corroboration both from Richard Dolan and from Linda Howe. Linda Howe interviewed this particular individual for like you know, 10, 15 hours on audio tape, but she never got the videotape, but I have the videotape. And that's you know, going to be part of the documentary that uh, Just Cause Productions and Stephen Bassett are working on. Yeah, and what you uh, managed to put together with that interview with a CIA re retiree was absolutely amazing. I think uh, Joe Kiernan has a question for you, Mr. Garner. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, yes, now, uh, I, I was curious, with, with J-Rod and, uh, I guess, our future ancestors, uh, when they do come here, are they coming here for the purpose of, as you said, sacrificial lambs? Are they coming here with purposes of benefiting us in the future, or do they have yes. other intentions? Yes, they are, and, and Dr. Rory used to identify them. The J-Rod that we're talking about, uh, his, his, his real name is Kela, C-E-A-L-A-H. It's on my site. Uh, he came here as a sacrificial lamb to help his people. And uh, he was very sad because he missed his family back on Bay Reticuli. He missed his, his wife and son and wanted to go back there. And so, uh, but there, and from Dan's point of view, it's hard to, to concept, conceptualize this, but he's from 52,000 years in our future. But on the same ship that crashed in Kingman, Arizona, there were... Uh, the other ones that were there were from 46,000 years in our future. And they don't have the best interest of uh, humans at heart. It's okay, but um, part of what our military has been doing all these years is helping them, and then they are helping us with technology. Uh -huh. And those, those beings that, uh, that were on the ship, they actually, one was an engineer, an, an ET engineer. So when Bill Uhouse was working with them at Los Alamos in the Area 51, when they were back engineering the, the UFO, they had to make it larger so our guys could, could, could seat, maybe seat themselves in it. And they didn't get the, 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 the things quite right, so then the ET engineer would come over with a formula and write it out. And our engineers were being instructed, instructed by the ET engineer how to build the craft. You know, so this just so goes and proves that, that aliens and humans are working together and the government's been hiding together. from it. Absolutely. You know, Ron, we also have Preston Dennett here, MUFON researcher of over 23 years, author of 15 amazing books, two more on their way. Uh, Preston, uh, you have a question for Ron, right? I do, I do. Um, hi, Ron. Yeah, hello, Preston. I remember when you... 
uh, researched that crop circle in Laguna Beach. Isn't that one the one that you first got back then? Um, th- that was a while back. <laughs> it's a long time ago, I know. But I thought I was impressed with your work then. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I've been doing this for a long time. I really enjoy it. But uh, yeah, so I'm really um, excited to speak with you. And I've got a question, which I think um, you might find kind of interesting. Fate Magazine did an experiment. Uh, this was like five or ten years ago, which they published in their magazine, where they asked their readers to remote view Area 51 or astral project to it and see what they came up with. Really? I loved it to see uh, what they had to say. Oh, you know, the results were amazing, and they were really consistent. They all said that there were, it was many levels underground. It was very large. They said there was reverse engineering going on. There was uh, ET hardware. They said there was live beings there, some of whom uh, were aware that they were being remote viewed. Yes, that's true. But what I found most fascinating, and this came up, you know, several people came up with this, and I had never heard it before. They said that they detected that some of the some of the people who work there with the ETs have been augmented, had their bodies changed in some ways by the ETs so that their health was improved or that they could live much longer than the average human. I'm wondering if you I haven't that. heard that, but that doesn't surprise me that there's some kind of genetic manipulation. Right. That's what uh, you know, abduction researcher David says that there's a hybridization going on. So that wouldn't surprise me if that's true. I, I don't know that from my research, but it, it sounds like it's a possibility. Well, certainly, you know, they're doing it to the people they abduct. So, but, uh, yeah, we're, that's pretty well established by the uh, <laughs> oh, abduction and, uh, research. And another question, you know, I've had several people tell me that there are tunnels under Area 51 that lead to Edwards Air Force Base and uh, to San Clemente Island, I believe it is, in Southern California, and other areas, and I was wondering if you could comment on that or what you heard about. Well, uh, I don't, I don't know this from Dr. Dan Burrish or from Bill Uhouse, but uh, John Lear is a good friend, and John Lear said that that's true. Uh, John Lear, you know, Lear Jet's uh, inventor's son, uh, he says there's actual, actually a tunnel from the Pacific Ocean, uh, like the submarines can come through into Nevada. Uh, so, yeah, there's a vast tunnel network uh, from there to probably uh, to Edwards, to Nellis, and maybe even as far as Los Alamos. It wouldn't surprise me. Wow. That's a vast Bill Uhouse did say that he, he was in some of the tunnels, and they were wide enough for two semi-trucks with a train in the center, you know, 70 or 80 feet wide. He was actually in those, uh, in those tunnels under Area 51. Wow. I wanted to know uh mr garner about technology leak from area 51 or has any of it trickled down to the public and uh you know some of the things that we're you know have as everyday devices is it leaked information and in, from area 51 some kind of technology that somehow helped mankind as of recent or are they still suppressing yeah well if, you, if you're familiar with the philip corso story i've done a documentary about him it's on my website uh, Corso says that, you know, very explicitly in his book, The Day After Roswell, and Bill Burns and I are good friends in uh, UFO Magazine. He's on the History Channel all the time. And uh, But, you know, Corso explains that the, the computer chip, uh, Teflar, uh, you know, all kinds of information came from the craft at Roswell. So... Uh, you know, at the hearings, I don't know if you heard that part, but one of the, I think it was the senator from uh, Alaska, someone in the panel had said that uh, Ben Rich, who is a former uh, president of Lockheed Skunk Works, said that the Air Force gave him a contract to take E.T. home. Now, I actually have that recording when Ben Rich said that at wright Patterson Air Force Base. And I've also interviewed Jan Harzan, who's head of MUFON Orange County, uh, where he heard Ben Rich say that at UCLA. So, uh, and I don't know where this is true, but I'll just state it, that I've talked to people inside aerospace companies and pilots and so forth, and two different ones that didn't know each other, and I always say, well, what percentage of the sightings are ours and what percentage are theirs? And both these people said that 60 to 70% are ours. 
<laughs> now that just amazed me. I didn't think that would that would be. I thought it would be just the reverse. So all of these sightings out there, and I've I've personally given up on sightings twenty years ago. I want to talk about who's inside that that light uh, that's, that's floating around in space, and that's why I focus on Area Fifty One and and uh, Los Alamos because that's where the beings are. So uh, as far as what's been you know come from Area Fifty One. S4 proper to the public, I don't know. I don't know what, uh, there's probably research that, that has come as, as far as genetic manipulation and so forth, but that's above my pay grade. Uh, at some point I can talk to Dr. Burrish about that because I'm very close to him. He's almost like my stepson. I was the best man in his wedding, and I know his story backwards and forwards. You know, <clears throat> Mr. Gardner, I have something to ask you about the MJ-12. Uh, we talked about, before we went on air, about Carl Sagan. I mean, he was like a big disinformation guy, yet at the same time he was trying to kind of, you know, talk about ETs, uh, you know, with SETI. Can you tell us his link to MJ-12 and also give us a MJ-12 me- uh, names? So you told me about an admiral. Yeah, Admiral McConnell is head of uh, Majestic 12 right now. And he's like the godfather for Dr. Dan Burry. So there's over 40 biologists that met untimely death. But Dr. Dan Burry, he was 48 or 49 in February the 2nd. And he's still alive. Uh, he suffered terribly from a lot of different things, but McConnell is the one that's protected him. But as far as Carl Sagan, I have this from three different sources, that Carl Sagan was read into the program and was... Um, you know, encouraged to debunk all of this. And, uh, but I think he had a turn of heart at the end of his life because he wrote the, the book Contact and a wonderful movie with Jodie Foster about contact. And that brings up something else, which I, I would like to just put out here between you and your, your many viewers or listeners. Uh, one of the books that's important I read early on, uh, I think it's called Omega Point. Uh, and it was written by Dr. Roger Lear's cousin, Kenneth Ring. And in that book, they linked the E.T. Uh, appearances with uh, deceased relatives. And if you remember in the movie Contact, Jodie Foster, uh, you know, when she went through the dimensional shift, who did she meet? She met her deceased father. So I think Carl Sagan was leaving a legacy to the people with that movie. I think he had a change of heart. And uh, there's another part of the story. I don't know if you know who uh, Carl Sagan's uh, first wife was. No. Uh, she teaches at uh, Amherst uh, University. And no, we're, had... we're coming on a break. Uh, everyone okay. stay tuned. Third Phase of Moon Radio will be right back. That's right. We are back on live on Third Phase of Moon Radio, and we're host Dr. J. Andy Elias on the phone with Ron Gardner, Blake Cousins, UFO hunter Joe Kiernan, also co-host and MUFON researcher and author Preston Dennett. Uh, before we go forward, just a few quick more announcements. Remind everybody next week on May 16th, same time, same place, 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we have Yvonne Smith, the 23rd, Robert Salas, and the 30th, Dr. Greer. Also, make sure if you captured anything amazing, you send it to Third Phase of Moon via Skype or Facebook. We're also looking for the best footage. If you have a footage of an entity or a footage of a UFO, send it. Make sure you're saying it for the Revolution Radio Contest to win an autographed book from Preston Dennett. Make sure you check out Ron Gardner's site that we're all talking about, which is Area51JRod.com. You'll see links on Third Phase of Moon when we actually get this out up there. And uh, other than that, let's return back to where we were. Be real quick. For all the listeners out there, the callers, area code 347-474-7228, extension 818. Again, if you want to call in, area code 347-474-7228, extension 818. Right before we went back on uh, break, uh, Gardner, Mr. Gardner, you were talking about Carl Sagan, his wife, and MJ-12. Can we pick that up again? Yeah, I will. Uh, it's really interesting because Carl Sagan's first wife, Lynn Margulis, she teaches biology. I think it's at Amherst. And uh, she and her son, Carl Sagan's son, wrote a book. I don't remember the name of it, but they're very strong environmentalists. 
And uh, at some point, I would like to have Dr. Burish uh, meet Lynn Margulis because they are very similar. Uh, Dr. Burish Crane is really into uh, helping the environment, and he has protocols to clean up the water supply. That's a major project that he's had uh, from teenagers on. Uh, but uh, back to Majestic, uh, you mentioned Admiral McConnell. J. Mike McConnell, in my humble, informed opinion, is the head of Majestic 12. And they, they changed some of the hierarchy. I know who all the 11 members are. I'm not going to identify them here. I will identify them on my site later on when the time is right. But McConnell is a moral compass of Majestic. He's a very honest person. So all of you researchers out there, if you don't believe me, just go find Admiral McConnell. Uh, I, I told this to Richard Dolan, and he, I think he's written a letter for McConnell. I don't know what's happened. But McConnell either will just turn away and uh, neither confirm nor deny, or he may say, yes, I know who Ron Garner is. I know what, who Dr. Burrish is. If he says that, uh, then that is a whole new game because we have the head of Majestic 12 stating that the Burry story is true. Uh, he's a poster boy for disclosure, and for whatever crazy reason, Ron Garner, the media guy, is supposed to make it happen. So that's why I've, I've researched these for 15, 20 years, and now in 2013, it started in 2012, I started releasing this information a little at a time. But Dr. Burry has told me that uh, with the looking class, they can see approximations of future events, not exactly, but approximations. And the 15, uh, 16 time frame is really dicey. And if that is going to be improved, we need to develop our spirituality. I've been a TM meditator my whole life. And uh, we need to develop our, our spirituality and help each other, you know, instead of all this greed that's going on. And I'm, I'm hoping if, if this takes place, then we'll have a better future. But if not, well, there's catastrophes in our future, which uh, we don't want to talk about. I want to ask you, uh, Ray Gardner, about, again, J-Rod. I, I just keep going back to J-Rod, but he's, you know, the most fascinating. Of course, yeah. And, I know. It's, it's, it's amazing. Thing. <laughs> it is. And, um, you know, has there, any bit, has there been any leaked video footage out there that, Anything from Area 51, uh, Sean? Yeah, there's been some? there's been some that, that were purported to be, but when I showed it to Dr. Brewery, they said, no, there's stuff on YouTube, but there's nothing as far as I know. There's some footage of, of a being, a uh, light shining down on him, and he's uh, drooling. I thought that might be true because the J-Rod, they were always, he was very sick. He was throwing up, and they had to you know, clean him up all the time. So I thought maybe that video was true, but Dr. Burry said, no, that wasn't him. It could have been another being there. I don't know. Uh, it's, it's, uh, but the, yeah. the thing is, they have hundreds of, of film and, and docu of Dr. Burry's with this J-Rod in the clean sphere. There's cameras all over, and the whole facility, there's, you can't be anywhere in that facility. There's, there's a camera on you and, and a guard with an automatic weapon makes it very difficult to work there because uh, the atmosphere is so oppressive with all these guards everywhere. And Bob Lazar said that, uh, uh, Bill Hughes has said that, and Dr. Burish Crane has said that too. It's, it's really difficult to work there under those conditions. And, uh, you know, the scientists are paid well, but uh, no amount of money can, in my idea of the way things would be, uh, to have that kind of oppressive uh, oversight of your whole life, the rest of your life, because once you go there, you sign those documents, and you have a handler. You have a handler that comes and checks on you once or twice a year, and you have to undergo polygraph tests, and you have to go through all kinds of things because they want to keep this wrapped up. And I, it, it it's terrible. It's a, it's a crime against science that they're um, they have these scientists. I know a lot of other facilities where scientists are doing things. And uh, it's very difficult for them to, to work under those conditions. It doesn't matter how much money you make. Well, let me ask you this, Ron. Um, you're releasing a lot of sensitive information. I don't know if you've covered this uh, yet or not, but have you ever been uh, threatened in any way? 
with all this information uh, on the yeah website? my 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 car was broken into three times master tapes were stolen um i think one of them was an actual vandalism but the other two i'm certain were black ops and uh they uh i told dr burish about that the dr burish was in 2005, the spring, he was on the board of uh, Majestic 12. He was number nine, the Majestic organization. And when I told him in 05 that I had a little bit of harassment, he put the order out and to stand down as far as I'm concerned. I haven't had any trouble since then. So uh, on, some level, expl- on some level, they're agreeing that he let this information out then. Yeah, well, when he was on the Majestic 12 committee uh, in April of 05, he, he called for a vote, and the vote was uh, six to five for disclosure. There's one abstention because it has to do with the protocols of the Freemasons. They don't want to tie, basically. So then in September of 05, the vote was taken again. This time was eight to three for disclosure for him. Now, people get confused. They say, well, if they voted for it. No, it's not voted for the committee itself. It's for Dr. Dan Burry's crane to release the information. Tell the world. And I have the actual uh, documents from Admiral O'Connell uh, that is directing and ordering uh, is basically a subordinate, Dr. Burry's, to tell the world. So that's what we're doing now. Uh, how could I get all this information about the most secret part of the most secret base unless somebody wanted it out? Right. There were leaks along the way, and that and people were harmed, and people had untimely deaths. But I, but I haven't had any trouble since so far. You know, Ron, before we went on air, we were talking about several things. One, you just mentioned about that vote for disclosure. Uh, We talked about a couple movies, the movie V, uh, Independence Day, and Avatar. How does that fit in with what's going on? Well, uh, I've been a film, uh, uh, you know, I'm involved in film at various levels my whole life. I was uh, involved with various television programs as a line producer and so forth. I'm very keen about movies. And the television series V, and most of I mean, Hollywood wants the people to be afraid because that's how they sell tickets. So the whole V thing had to do with fear. Now, it's very interesting about Independence Day. I, I have a lot to say about that. We probably don't have enough time in this segment. But uh, the people, I don't know if you know, when they first de- decided to make the movie Independence Day, they went to the military and they solicited their their help. And they said, oh, yeah, we'll help you. But then when they told about it was Area 51, then the military backed off. So the, the producers of the movie Area of Independence Day had to use uh, National Guard troops uh, for the scenes in the movie. So, uh, and there's another important thing. I've never told this before in public, but I'll, I'll release it now. At Area 51, they have what they call the wise men. There are three older men that walk around in white coats and white socks and white shoes, and they live there their whole life. And it's their job to to try and make everything done uh, in, in, a, in a very uh, you know professional way. But in the movie Independence Day, you remember when... The president's going to view the craft, and there's a scientist with long hair and a white coat, and he runs up there and says, oh, Mr. President, blah, blah, blah. Well, that was based actually on these wise men that actually live at Area 51 S-4. Uh, well, they approached uh, Dr. Burry's to be one of them, but he said, no, he couldn't live there. It's, it's like a commitment uh, that he would never be able to stay there all the time. But these, these three... Uh, men, they're, they're there and they, they live there as a permanent. Uh, it's interesting with uh, uh, Independence Day, Ronald Emmerich was trying to get permission from the U.S. military to, you know, fly, get access to the aircraft <laughs> carriers, jets, and uh, they're ready to go for it. They were actually ready to participate, uh, you know, because it was kind of go America had a good uh, thing going for, you know, United States propaganda anyway. What happened was, is that in the script, they brought in the Area 51 scene. And the Pentagon and the military said, well, if you cut that scene out, we'll go ahead and help. But then the director standed strong and said, no, we're going to keep it in. So the military dropped out of any help. I think uh, Joe Kiernan has a question for you. 
Okay, hello, Joe. Yeah. Yes, hi. Uh, we're in, in Arizona where J. Rod's craft had crashed. Uh, okay. There's a lot of people that are, uh, that raise the questions that, that there are also there for a lot of particular minerals that are necessary for them in the future. Uh, That's true. Are they, yeah. are they also coming here with interest for, for elements, for, uh, for protection of their own species in the future, or something that was not yes, one of the, the main, the main, the main element is boron. Boron is very valuable. There's only like two or three places on Earth that has it. And I think uh, at China Lake is where there's a lot of it in that general you know, area between California and Nevada. So, yeah, boron is very important. So the, the, heavy, the heavy metal groups would be most important. Well, I can yeah, there, I have other people that um, have, have discovered uranium mines in Europe between France and Spain that the ancient people, thousands of years, ancient aliens were digging out uranium there. I have that from other sources. Yeah, so, there's, yeah, there's different minerals, and uh, they they can take these things back to their uh, their planet, and, uh, I'm, you know, it, it's important to them. And the gold, if you think why it's such a that old story. I have, yeah. I have no doubt that that's true, because there's a very strong link between uh, UFO sightings and landings and mines, you know, across the right. world. So, right. absolutely, I see that link. I was wondering if it was ne- if it was somehow necessary for... For uh, for transportation for uh, J. Rod and, and his people to come back and forth. No, no, not not those minerals. They they have uh, the technology is Stargate. That's what I call my company, Stargate, because that's the key to everything. If you <laughs> if you dig down into it, uh, Einstein Rosen Bridge is a ty- the scientific name for this. So if you people can just Google that Einstein Rosen Rosen Bridge phenomenon. Uh, Miss Yukaku talks about it, and uh, all of these wonderful movies, you know, like uh, Wormholes and Sliders, and, and and they're they're addressing that issue. I think these beings are coming and going through these different uh, portals, and uh, you know, the, yeah, it really the makes time change. more more of a physical understanding. It's, it's that's right, and that's what I think that Hitler was doing too. Hitler was was. was uh, contacting these people. That's a whole other story, which I don't want to go in, get into right now, but uh, these beings were coming and going, you know, the Aryan race, and he was studying the Vimanas in, in uh, India and, and going after the technology in Tibet and all that. History Channel uh, has done a wonderful job in, in exploring all that. Yeah, he sure had a lot of the right pieces of the puzzle for, for going in the right direction there. Right. So, uh, in this other series, which a friend of mine's son is the editor of it, uh, 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 UFO Files Disclosure, Disclosure, uh, it's on uh, KTLA on uh, Channel 5 on uh, Saturday nights at 11 o'clock. It's a wonderful show, just great information. So, so it's getting out there, and this, this brings up the, the issue, which is that the ET people, this is really important, I'm glad I remember to say this, They've actually signed treaties with these beings, and part of the treaty says that they must release this information. They changed the timeline at different times, but uh, the basic idea is the ET people uh, want this information out. And so that's the reason that, that Dr. Burish and Bill Uhouse and Bob Lazar and myself and other people have this information, because it's our job, our task, to put this out to the public. What is and, the timetable uh, then? I mean, how long are we talking until we get full, complete disclosure of all this? I, I don't know that. I, I've, I've, I've ruminated about that on my mind all the time. Uh, at different time frames, time, I, I think originally there was supposed to be a major disclosure in the 1980s because Linda Howe was uh, contracted with HBO to... Uh, get this information out and Richard right, Doty right. And, I remember you know, that was, yeah. was you know and then they did that other series in eighty nine. So uh I think it was supposed to be, but there's some reason that they had to change change the timeline. I don't know I know a little bit about it but I'm not not enough to really discuss it on your air here. But there there is a there is a time frame and that 
Uh, part of the, what the military is concerned about is a convergent timeline paradox, because when you change something, it isn't that the kill your grandfather idea. It's the idea that the, a new uh, time continu continuum starts. So you may kill your grandfather, but he he still lives in another uh, dimension, and that's and that's very confusing. And so when they change the timeline, uh, it's very dangerous. And that's why part of the reason that they confiscated these um, Stargate technology, it's hooked up with the looking class on my site. You can, I have a, a brief description of the looking class. The looking glass has cameras, four of them, and they have noble gases, argon and other things. And uh, they project in there and they can see approximations of the future and past events. So, uh, and also if it's, if it's rotated in 45 degrees, it can be a teleportation device too. I don't know a lot about that. But uh, this technology is just uh, burgeoning out and um, uh, the whole UFO community needs to focus on my site and, and uh, the other sites on citizens hearing they did a one the whistleblowers that were there I, eventually I want to have a hall of fame for these whistleblowers that have come forward you know risking life and limb and their their families and everything uh, to get this information out and now it's 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 really flowing big time this I think this year could be the year where we have this closure John Podesta has said it um, Stephen bassett has has made a uh, quite a, a, a plea to Podesta to uh, have Podesta and his group release this information because he, he wrote a forward to Leslie Keene's book. He was, uh, you know, the transition head for Obama, and he was head of uh, Clinton's uh, uh, administration. So he's a key figure, and I'm hoping that John Podesta will give, give the green light to uh, UFO researchers and and, and put his weight behind the disclosure. I'm, I'm hoping that he will. You know, Ron, I wanted to ask you about the citizens' hearing. I, I was a little pessimistic going in because, you know, they, Stan Friedman and Gordon Cooper and others testified in front of the Congress in 1968. But this time it was a little different because over the course of the five days, you saw the transformation from skeptics to true believers that something is going on and some civilizations, plural, are visiting us. Do you think this is going to have a major impact in, in disclosure? I mean, what's it going to take to get disclosure to happen this year? Well, I had a long talk with Stephen Bassett just today about that, that I think uh, I was concerned, as you were, that the Congress people uh, that were going to be chosen, you know, would... Big, give a big yawn, but they're, they it was it was jaw dropping. They were transfixed. You know, it was amazing how, how that information flowed into their minds, and uh, especially Burroughs and Peniston from Reynoldson Forest. And they got behind that. They they want to help them get their records out from the Air Force. They were really engaged, and I'm hoping this now will go to the UN. Uh, when I talked to Stephen Bassett today, he said they're pursuing that. I have some strong connections in the UN. I, I can really be beneficial about that. And uh, the, someone said that there was a uh, protocol back in '68 uh, where they they could use that now to open up a certain committee or uh, you know with the UN. I, I could have brought I, I, I could have brought a lot of other people from other countries that I've researched, but there wasn't that much time. But the people they had, it was just perfect. I, I, I couldn't uh, agree with you more. It, it, it was just wonderful, the, the, the panel. And every, I think this is a game changer. I really do. So many of the, the ex-conferences and the conferences that go on are press conferences for a couple hours and it's gone. But this is five days and it's archived. It's going to be in five different languages. Uh, I can't see how it's, it's not going to make a major contribution uh, to disclosure, but at the same time, we have to know the media is infiltrated by intelligence people, and they put a kibosh on it. Uh, you know, Terry Hansen, I would like to have had him. He wrote a book about all this, about the media and the intelligence groups. Uh, right, but, go ahead. 
I just wanted to say we're getting near the end of the show. We have a you know few minutes left. I wanted to uh, mention everybody check out the Alien Project, the Roger Lair Alien Human uh, Project, the Alien Human Project. Excuse me, right there at Third Phase of Moon, Roger Lair removing extraterrestrial implants from abductees. Check it out. So, and uh, also, let, let, me, let me inject something here. Uh, Do- Dr. Roger Lear gave Dr. Dan Burry's one of the implants. And Dr. Roger Leary says it on my site. You can go to testimonials that Dr. Uh, Burry's cream gave the best analysis of an implant of anybody that he's ever taken it to in the past. And I have it on my site. You can download it. And we're going to have Dr. Burry here soon one day, right? Uh, I can work it out, yes. We have to develop certain protocols. That, uh, yeah, for yeah. sure. We will. Yeah. Blake, Do you think we can get uh, Bob Lazar on as well? In the right situation. I, I, I'm good friends with John Lear, and, uh, and that's a long story, but it, it, it could happen, yeah. Uh, but he, he's, you know, that's the thing about Dr. Burish. He's a scientist, and uh, Bob Lazar is a scientist. And they don't want to write books and give conferences and make videos. They just want to do their science. So they don't want to be pulled away from their scientific endeavors. In the case, in the case of Dr. Burry's crane, that's different because he's been ordered by Majestic to get this information out. Uh, well, they're, so, they're true whistleblowers, and we'd love to, for the, the, the public to hear from them. But real quick, before the show ends, we want to remind all the listeners to make sure you check out everything we talked about on Ron Gardner's website, www.area51jrod.com. Again, area51jrod.com. Also, Alien Human Project on th- Third Phase of the Moon. And Blake, of course, tell them if they've captured anything amazing. You know, um, you know, this has been an incredible show. And with over 54 million views on Third Phase of the Moon and 75,000 subscribers, we can get the information out real quick. And I really want to thank Mr. Ron Gardner for joining us right here at Third Phase of the Moon. And I look forward to uh, getting some materials so we could uh, spread the word. Yes, we need to because there's a groundswell. And that's what the ET people are, are, are happy with, is that the grassroots are, are the ones that are pushing this. The, we, the hierarchy we are at the end of the show. Sorry, Ron. Okay. Uh, everyone up there, Area 51. Welcome back to the third phase of minutes. My name is Blake Cousins, and we're live today, Friday, May 24th, 2013, and we're going to go over some amazing, uh, you know, videos that we received right over here at Third Phase of Moon for the month of May, and it's been quite a busy month. We've been real busy on the ground. We uh, took a look at the volcano, the Kilauea volcano, and wanted to find out what was going on over there in regards to the phenomenon and possible portals using the volcanoes, and we... Found 3,000 year old carvings, old ancient carvings right here in Hawaii that could possibly be proof of ancient aliens. And so I found some evidence of what looked to me like maybe the Hawaiians possibly, um, you know, were abducted themselves and they carved it in stone right there at Puuko. And, you know, amazing interviews with, uh, you know, friends like Dr. J. Andy Elias setting up amazing in- interviews with, uh, you know, the whistleblower. Ray Gardner in regards to the J-Rod, uh, Ron Gardner, uh, you know, J-Rod escaped from Area 51. He explains how through a Stargate, an incredible, uh, you know, just insight coming into third phase of the moon. We also got a video from Qatar of a man flying in an airplane, capturing a UFO right side, right outside from the cabin, out in the foreground behind the wing. A UFO suddenly appears and he captures uh, an amazing uh, video of what looks to be a UFO. And most people, there's a lot of people out there saying it's like a star or or a planet or a weather balloon, even saying going to that uh, far extent. And this thing actually vanishes into thin air. And I don't think weather balloons or stars or anything like that just absolutely vanish and uh, dematerialize out of thin air. And then another amazing video from Oklahoma. Unfortunately, there was a disaster over there with the tornado, but there was a man on the ground right there, just right outside of Moore, Oklahoma, right minutes after the tornado, what appears to be a fleet of UFOs, uh, you know, rising out of the aftermath. And then unfortunately, there was life lost, but 
you know, there was um, something maybe that the aliens wanted to take a look at what was going down on the ground over there. So we're taking uh, calls from around the world, and the number to call in is 347-934-0378. And we got our uh, special correspondent, Dr. J. Andy Elias, right here at Third Phase Moon. Welcome. Thank you, Blake. How are you? Hey, we're doing uh, doing good, just, you know, keeping busy, a lot of video coming in, and uh, we look forward to taking some testimony. I wanted to, um, you know, ask you to come on board tonight to tell everybody what's going on with this amazing book you and I collaborated on. Oh, yes, the first of its kind for Third Phase of the Moon, Third Phase of the Moon, the largest UFO YouTube channel, and for all those people listening out there, this is the new station to get your UFO news. We are coming out with a book. Blake and I collaborated on it, and it's the top 12 sightings that we thought were the the coolest and the best. They got amazing photographs, and you'll hear the inside story of what each one was about. Actually, there was a few that I interviewed the people, and just to get the deep, deep inside story was amazing, and all the readers out there are going to get to see it very soon. Yeah, we really look forward to sharing this book. We had testimony... And you did a lot of interviews from people around the world, including Australia and the UK and, uh, you know, all the way in, in, in uh, Myrtle Beach. And, you know, we're trying to co- cover the four corners of the earth, getting people's amazing videos so they could showcase it right here at Third Phase of Moon. We're going to go to our next caller. Stand by, John. Area code 201. Welcome to Third Phase of Moon. Hey, what's going on, Blake? It's Mark. Hey, Mark, how's it going? So um, what do you think about some of the videos that you've uh, seen on Third Phase? It, it basically, let's go to uh, the video of the UFO uh, captured from within the cabin on a flight on its way back to Qatar. And where in Qatar? Yes. Oh, you didn't get to see that video? Oh, no, no, I didn't see that one yet. But I was. I wanted to talk about a little bit about the one seen in Oklahoma and the one yes, tornado. Uh, yeah, the- the fleet of UFOs over uh, Moore, Oklahoma, after the tornado. Go go ahead. Uh, tell us your thoughts on what you saw there. So, yeah, I was thinking about it, and I came to a couple of conclusions that, you know, actually, if you look at that date, that's the date where in Teotihuacan, where that means, you know, where man met with God, with the gods, um, that date, the sun aligned above the sun pyramid on the 19th. You know, and people were expecting something to happen on that day as well, you know. And I found evidence that, that this this disaster wasn't, you know, like um, a natural disaster. It was man-made, you know, using uh, J2X pumps, you know, from, you know, rockets that pump. Every second they pump hundreds of pounds of hydrogen and oxygen to the air through a chamber not larger than a spaghetti pot. So, if you look at that, that that's actually called TMC cloud, or a, you know, it's a, it's a it's a torus molecular cloud. So, um, that that pumps out like a you know like like a big ass cloud, and it and with harp and all that, the engineer it's coming to you know some kind of some kind of storm, and well, let's uh, you know let's get. To- Let's get to harp about, uh, you know, Jesse Ventura spoke of, um, you know, the conspiracy that he claims that he basically talked to some people in the know about this uh, weapon that the United States may have. I have no idea, but they're claiming that they have the power to control weather. What about that, John? And what did you think of the video uh, over there in Moore, Oklahoma? You know, I think that was a crazy video, and that goes on to collaborate with what many people are saying, that these visitors are watching every amazing event you know everything from columbus coming to the the u.s the new world at the time from 9 11 to this 9 11 oklahoma what i think this oklahoma footage shows what i think it's the greatest is the fact that it's a fleet it's a fleet of unknown objects that are there with 300 mile hour per winds i mean and they're just behaving in their own world and i think that's just i give the guy Props who who caught it, and on the same time, I think it's one of the better videos out there. You know, he, um, you know, I I love it when people are filming the UFOs and they have their own commentary 
as we're watching their experience at the first time. And, uh, you know, when he's seeing it, he quite was seemed very uh, excited at the time of filming it. He was kind of almost in disbelief, but he uh, just really, after a while, he told me after he uh, allowed us to put it on third phase that it was a life-changing or mind-blowing experience. Now, let's get to the footage from, um, you know, Qatar, the airplane footage. Let's go into a little bit of detail on this. Because people have a lot of opinion on it. What did you think and what did you come away with after seeing the video, Dr. J, Andy Elias? You know, that's another great footage that came from a plane. I, You know, you posted another one that might have been from Korea. There's a lot that have been going around the Internet. But this is great because this is coming out of the Middle East Clearly, it's on a commercial flight, and if you watch the wing, which is traveling parallel to the ground, you see this object come up and kind of go at a 45-degree a angle or so upwards, and it's clearly not stationary, so some debunkers might say, oh, it's a moon, or it's a star, or it's a uh, you know space station. No, it's not. Look at it. Watch the way it moves. Pay close attention to where the ground is, to where the wing is and to where the object is moving. And that right there is another one of the great videos out there right now. That is definitely something that deserves to have further investigation. And thank God for Third Phase of the Moon showing it because if you guys didn't show it to the world, it may have became, you know, a lost mystery. You know, we, um, we try to analyze it the best we could. We blew it up a thousand percent and slowed it down 900 percent and we look at it frame by frame and we could tell that the object is not uh, you know like some light from within the cabin shining out the window it is actually out there and the way it disappears i don't know what after all the comments i've read and uh, you know the ufo experts nobody ever says anything about it just dematerializing in thin air we show the video and it there, there's an end to it and uh, it disappears that's what's amazing to me about some of the comments on, uh, you know, why they think it's a planet. Planets just don't disappear. Absolutely. And the fact that it just dematerializes is a, is a very, very big ordeal. And people overlook that. You know, they really do. And it's a shame because that right there is just showing that there's a different technology that is completely more advanced than the physics that we humans on this earth are supposed to know or what is ta taught to us at schools we just uh at released a video yesterday um you know an alien type spacecraft there are like multiple crafts caught in this video and what it looked to us is that they were actually surveying like some kind of a power plant of some sort and we we're getting feedback from the uk the jsb 007 uh, a great ufo hunter out there you know, had comments saying that they were actually, uh, you know, like Mark was saying about the chemtrails earlier. Maybe they're really concerned about, you know, the release of the chemicals into the air and causing this global warming uh, disaster, quote unquote. What did you think of the video? To me, it, you know, it really looked amazing to me. The lights were popping and, uh, you know, it looked like they were flown under some kind of intelligent design and they were real graceful in their, uh, you know, their way of flying through flying through the air the way they did. Oh, I completely agree. I completely agree. You know, there's something going on in this planet. There's an increase of sightings, and yes, it's it's known that everybody now has a camera in their pocket, so more people are filming this, you know, phenomena. But MUFON and other reporting agencies have reported, you know, a large increase in the sightings. Something is happening and it seems like they are paying attention to what we're doing to this earth. Whether it be through polluting it or using the oil, destroying our fossil fuels, all of that combined. And I'm sure they have the solutions and you know the $600 trillion a year industries would sort of collapse overnight if things such as free energy actually came to fruition. And I don't know if that's the big argument, but... It seems to be so that they're definitely interested in the well-being of this planet. So, you know, Mark, what do you have to, uh, do you have a opinion of what do you think the alien agenda is? Or are they concerned about uh, the way the people, uh, you know, control the environment and uh, you know, put it in jeopardy in its way of our, our lifestyle living? Yeah, 
actually, uh, yeah, I wanted to talk about that. Actually, that one guitar as well. I think actually I did remember seeing that one, and I just wanted to say about that and what, and what you just said that 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 craft, whatever it was, it looked like something like out of the movies, like something like that we probably created us humans or something something like humans that you know that just looks like something out of Stargate SG-1 or something, you know, just flying through the air like a military shuttle program. Remember I was telling last, I called a couple of weeks ago and I was telling you about the, the military shuttle program that they, that's they been confirmed, actually, and mainstream news, you know, and, and uh, so... Well, let's talk about, uh, let's talk about where, where some of that actually came from, and we're doing some uh, major work and some, uh, you know, some groundbreaking information coming out this week in regards to area 51 j rod and you know the test vehicles and the reverse engineering tell us a little bit about what we took away on uh, you know these interviews with uh, you know the couple of people uh, one of them was mr uh, ray gardner ron gardner uh, Oh, yes, Ron, Ron Guardian. Guardian. You mean, yeah. Oh, he is definitely connected to the inside the secret government. You know, he's, I don't know what his connection is, but he definitely seems to have knowledge before it comes out. He's good friends with Dan Burrish. He claims to be friends with one of the MJ1 members. And he basically reconfirmed a story of S4 where there was apparently a crash in Kingman, Arizona in 1953. And there was a gray that survived. And they brought it to Area 51, and in particular, S4. Now, people who go to S4, do, or people who go to Area 51 do not have the clearance to get into S4. So it's, it's definitely higher up, it's, it's, but it's, it's within Area 51. Nonetheless, that being was kept there for decades, and Dr. Dan Burris was working with it. Uh, that was just one of the many things he revealed, on top of there being several back-engineered craft uh, you know, he's definitely someone we need to have back on because he's got some more revelations to make for the public, and he's just about ready because he's getting in age. Yeah, we also received uh, a video um, graciously from Open Minds TV, which we put out a third phase, and it went very viral because this past week we've been focusing heavy on Area 51. And the Schaefer went into detail at the 2011 Congress, UFO Congress, and, uh, you know, basically confirmed what Ron Gardner was saying and you know the whole story is basically really tight and I really believe what they were saying is basically the truth and uh, I felt really happy about the end we called it escape from area 51 for a reason because J-Rod was able to you know go home through the Stargate and I thought that was absolutely fantastic and uh, they should basically make a movie on that what do you think John? Oh, I completely agree. And, you know, speaking of Stargates, there apparently are several of them. You know, when people talk about the war in Iraq that we went, the U.S. invaded in 2003, which was sort of linked to 9-11, they say we went after these weapons of mass destruction. Well, I've read in more than one source, a few sources, that we did find weapons of mass destruction. It wasn't chemical. It wasn't nuclear it wasn't biological weapons that we found, but the weapons of mass destruction we found was Project Yellow Book, which Yellow Book came from looking glass technology, which came from the Roswell wreckage. What it is is basically a device that tells that person or gives them a glimpse into their future, and it could change varying on their moods. Now, there was an agreement among the MJ-12 members to dismember all of them because these were creating wars, and they literally were. So everybody complied except Saddam Hussein. So when George Bush said we were going into Iraq to fetch a weapon of mass destruction, we did. And the first place that we attacked, if the first place that we took over was one of his museums. And we built some special steps to get things down. And it was, it was, there was a, quite a secretive operation going on there. And it just makes you want to wonder, why go after a museum? What's there? Who's hiding there? But, uh, there are stargates uh, everywhere. There's ancient gods, Egypt, Greece, South America, where the mines were, uh, Easter Island, uh, everywhere, everywhere at the time. But it's definitely an inter interesting topic, and that can be on go on for for decades. Just talking about you know that. Uh, maybe it was one of the reasons uh, besides the attack because you know George Bush really didn't have any reason to go after Iraq and. 
to go after a Stargate and knowing what was going on in the country. And if Saddam had power like that, maybe that is one good reason that we went in there. And they kept it a secret from us. And hopefully that goes in uh, directions to help uh, the U.S. and in general. Let's um, no, let's get to the subject and still stick to uh, the military and what was with these wars because there's some rumor going out. In, uh, about Afghanistan and the Varama ship in a cave and there's been 15 U.S. soldiers that went missing trying to retrieve the you know this Varama UFO found in an Afghani cave have you heard anything about this absolutely and this is a huge huge story and I'm wondering why no one's covered it or what's come to fruition since what happened was is there was a Vimana a Vimana is basically described as a flying craft that was written into the ancient Hindu book, holy book. I don't remember the name. I think it's the Mahabharata, something like along the lines of that. And it's basically described these ships from 3,000 and 4,000 years ago that were flying the way saucers fly right now, flying saucers. Nonetheless, in Afghanistan, apparently the military found one, the U.S. military found one in a cave that had been in some sort of time vault. And within 24 hours of finding this Vimana, almost every head of state from the Western world, the head of state from the U.K., Obama sent somebody, the Vladimir Putin's emissary went, uh, someone from China came, the, the French president, Everybody came to visit it within 24 hours. Now, what was decided among those heads of the states, I don't know. But nonetheless, they all met there in Afghanistan in a war zone because there was a Vimana found. And, that, and if a, that gets to the press, that would be a huge, huge story because it would confirm everything they've been saying. I think the way it would be leaked one way or the other is from uh, the family members themselves because they would have to have some kind of reason why their you know, son or daughter went missing in Afghanistan, and they have to be informed what was going on. So hopefully, you know, the families will come forward, because I'm sure they may be pressed not to uh, speak about it because of national security. But it really seems that there's something going on over there. I don't know if it's some kind of story that's thrown out to you know, throw us on a curve, but the way the information is coming in from a few different sources, it seems... Like, it's a very legitimate story. And with all these other countries, like you just said, China, Russia, getting involved, who's going to be able to get their hand on it? Are they going to be able to cut it up and slice it up like a piece of pie, or is it one whole piece? And how are they going to keep that from a, as a combined countries keeping secrets together? Hopefully, you know, one side leaks, leaks it one way or the other. You know, that's what we truly hope is for the disclosure to happen. Uh, obviously, there are national security reasons. When you have a device that can fly in any direction without having inertia, killing the pilot after several hundred miles an hour, something that's flying 10,000 miles an hour and makes a 90-degree turn, obviously that is a huge advantage in air warfare or even bombing missions from one country to another. So whoever possesses such a technology definitely has an advantage over those who don't. And that could be a huge national security concern. Now, if most of those countries know already, then what is really the secret to be hiding? Now, I'm still sure there are some of those concerns. Like Stanton Friedman said, there shouldn't be full disclosure. But I think there should be somewhat disclosure. That we should at least be told that we're not alone because it is truly the height of arrogance to believe that we're not alone in, in this vast, vast universe uh, with the Kepler telescope finding habitable planets on a almost a daily basis at this point. You know the, you know the the continuous cover up. Okay, let's just say they, the Varama they found this ancient artifact that dates back you know two hundred fifty thousand years ago, and they release it. I'm not saying that it works. It seems like it's not a functional piece, but they have something in their possession that. You know, it's just absolutely a fantastic arche archaeological find. Let's just put it out there in a sense of that way. We don't have to admit that we're, you know, from this alien in origin. Let's just produce the artifact and let's, you know, look at it as a history kind of point of view. Mark, what would you have to say about the Varama and, you know, these other governments getting their hand on things? 
of you know getting the Actually, possession of. I I would I would like to say that you know this this whole alien agenda thing started off with basically mainly the you know the Roswell incident. Which led to, you know, eventually the NASA program and, and flying into space. And I think it, that it's more than just our curiosity that was just the cause of all this. this is the, the whole NASA, everything was a big cover up at the end of the day for you to believe when these aliens come that they are gods or something like that. And that, you know, they're meant to rule over us, you know. And then, but at the end of the day, it's really that they're not meant to last. The only thing that's meant to last is God and Christ, you know. And that's where you got to find the truth. You know what I'm saying? I may have lost Mark there. Hey, um, let's get back to some more of the amazing video coming in. Days of Moon. And, uh, you know, J-Rod, again, let's J-Rod, people have been very fascinated about what's been uh, put out this past week. And uh, we were putting out some exclusives basically in regards to, you know, the genitalia of the alien. Uh, apparently nobody's ever seen these pictures before, and it was classified. Let's go into a little bit of detail. It seems like there was some some kind of, um, you know, what? how would you describe it, Dr. J? I don't know, but this is actually a, a, a sad but true statement. There was some protocol at S4 which required the naked, the alien to be naked, and that's why it was drawn in such a way uh, but I just think it's funny that it's making a firestorm then again you know what does an alien thing look like anyway but the point being is this alien for five decades plus had to live in such a way where it never closed itself from when it was found in a suit or so they say was there any information of what came out um, I don't know if I missed it or if you or anybody else knows about like what they what they ate over there, what the what the the government fed them. You know, that's one thing I've actually been asking, and I haven't got that answer. But Dr. Burrish goes into this complete different conspiracy that I've ever heard, uh, but other people seem to have corroborated it. Basically, it's called the Doctrine of Convergent Timelines, and what it means is that there are different timelines and. Since a spacecraft can alter gravity, if it can do so, then it can alter time, and therefore it's a time machine. Well, by doing that, you could travel through time. Apparently, this gray alien, the J-Rod, was an extraterrestrial and a human. It was a human 52,000 years in the future that, after some catastrophic event, lived underground. The Nordics are the ones that were able to live above ground. After several thousand years, apparently, they went to the moon... And then they went to Mars, and then they went to the Reticuli. Let's get this. And then they the populated viewers. three planets there. J. Rod basically. So J. Rod is not an alien. He is. Um, he he's not he he's he's an alien, but he's not an extraterrestrial. He's not from another planet. He's he's you know he's basically from Earth, and he's uh you know like you just said from the future. So he's not an extraterrestrial, but he's kind of alien to what we're accustomed to as a human right now. Exactly. Right? According to Dan Burrish, that's exactly what what he's saying, yes. That this is this is fifty two thousand years in the future of what we would look like living underground. No, we want to thank uh Bradford Blair for being here, Fabian Starr, the Palladian Truth, all chiming in here listening right here on Third Phase of Moon Live. And if anybody's got any questions, we've got a few minutes left and it's uh you should call in at three four seven nine three four zero three seven eight. We got a few more minutes right here at third phase. Now, you know, J Rod, let's get to more of this. So, you know, he escaped, but now there's other beings that were left behind. Are they still living that we're aware of? And uh, how are they being treated? Basically the same as they did J-Rod, and do they have names of any kind? You know, I don't know the other names. I've heard J-Rod's real name is Kayla. I've heard some other ones that I didn't stick to memory, uh, or some other ones that are possibly Semyazi is the one, but I don't know how true that one is. But there are several aliens living amongst us. There's hybrids. Apparently, this is according to researchers and whistleblowers. There was an exchange program where 12 aliens came to Earth and 12 humans went to whatever planet they were from, possibly Zeta Reticuli. Out of those 12 humans, only 8 returned. 2 apparently died on that planet. 2 returned home. and Or 2, two decided to stay and 8 returned home. Uh, of these aliens, there's still a, a, a 
uh, program going on where they're going back and forth. They're living amongst us and there's different species and they're actually working side by side with humans in these underground extraterrestrial bases and they're uh, helping us bridge the gap with technology. At least this is what the whistleblowers are saying. Well, let's get back to, um, you know, the, we, the Area 51 story is quite amazing. New uh, testimony has been coming out with a uh, the retired CIA guy claiming that the military is ready to overrun it with the U.S. Army, along with Eisenhower behind uh, commander in chief operating the whole thing. And but they did, decided not to do it. Is there any way that we're ever going to find out what's happening with Area 51? It seems like they're their own uh, country right now and uh, go by the, their own rule. Honestly, I don't think we'll ever get the full truth. And for national security reasons, A, and B, because things are going to private contractors, if you want to get things out of the hands of where people can see them, put them in a private corporation. Things like Blackwater USA, which you know helps VIPs, private military in other countries, well, they can also be responsible for guarding Area 51 and S4. So it's very possible that there are these joint military Slash private corporation bases or just bases that are run with private citizens that are never going to be answerable to the United States citizens. It's sad, but it's more than likely true. Hey, if anybody's online right near here in the flash chat, and uh, we continue on to the break, if the air cuts, if it cuts out on air, YouTube here in the future, but we're going to continue the. Uh, radio show here for a few minutes. Anybody want to comment on the flash chat, ask any questions for Dr. Jandy Elias, myself, Blake Cousins right here at Third Phase of Moon, go for it. And, uh, you know, we're, people uh, are saying here that they're saying there's a lot of U- Area 51 UFO technology right now going. It's been moved to Utah from uh, Flycatch. That's a pretty good uh, insight. And, uh, you know, maybe Area 51 isn't what it used to be and uh, right now. And Maybe they have relocated it to Utah. I've heard that a few times. Have you heard any of that through the, um, you know, the grapevine there, Dr. J? I've heard the same thing. I've heard Utah is one of the bases and Dulce, New Mexico. I don't know the city in Utah, but Dulce, New Mexico seems to be another Area 51 sort of like base. Now, Wright-Patterson has always been a secretive base. There are hangars there that you you, you have to have the highest security to get into. But nonetheless, like you said, Utah is on the top of the list of being something new, and so is Dulce, New Mexico. Now, let me add something about Area 51. Ever since the federal government finally acknowledged it recently, prior to that, they wouldn't acknowledge it even though it appeared on the cover of Popular Mechanics from a Soviet satellite picture. Besides that point, the moment the U.S. public started, and the world for that matter, started to get a hold of what was going on there in the early 90s when people started to see weird things flying in late 80s, I think personally they moved everything out of there into some other base because the base that they're probably doing the most secret stuff right now is probably completely unknown to us. Now that we're talking about Utah and Dulce, New Mexico, there's a good chance they moved out of there too. Well, you know, we could still go on more about Area 51 and what's been going on right here at Third Phase of Moon, but unfortunately our radio show is going to be closing here in a couple minutes. But before we shut it down, I really want to uh, thank Mark for joining us. Mark, any quick last words for our viewers at Third Phase of Moon? Yeah, I just wanted to mention I heard about um, a couple secret bases like in Colorado that are underground as well as hidden runways in Africa and places, you know, exotic like that and, and, and deserted locations that, you know, UFOs and military jets or planes, you know, come down. And, you know, it's just, they're all over the place, just like they were all over the place in ancient times. They're still all over the place now, but they're just hidden, you know. Right now it's covert, and soon it will be, you know, revealed to us, you know. But right now, you know, it's still not the time. That's why we're still holding information. But at the same time, it's it's leaking out. You know, at the same time, it's leaking out. So, because it's not all meant to happen at the same on the same day. It's it's meant for you to see, so you can feel it and you feel what's happening. And that's how you change your mind, either whether the good side or the bad side, whatever side that is. But personally, I believe the good side is where God and Christ is, and the bad side is where the angel, I mean, the fallen angels and the Anunnaki and all they. And the greys lie, you know, and you got to pick a side because I, all I know is that 
the alien side is not meant to last, no matter what, you know, happened. You know what I'm saying? So, I think we know what you're saying here, and I think uh, a lot of people listening right now know what you're saying. Hey, thanks a lot, Mark, for joining us. And, um, you know, now, you know, it's been a good show tonight. Dr. Danny Lass, I wanted to ask you, let's get back to the third phase of Moon, the book that we're going to be releasing here very shortly right here, and we're going to be putting it up on our website. We picked the top 12. Do you have a favorite, and do you want to go into a little bit, give a little bit of detail to our viewers and listeners about what you think your favorite out of the out of the twelve is right here and and um, go ahead. You know, actually, I'm leaning over t- towards two. The first one would have to be the Latunda, which the witch doctor, which alien, whatever you call it. Most people call it the Chupacabra. Others would call it the Tunda, uh, whatever. That is one of my favorites. Where a Colombian farmer stalks out this beast that's been hunting goats and dogs and chickens and other animals, you know, on that island, and he shoots it dead, and you see the before picture and the after photo. I think that is definitely my favorite. As far as vehicles, mine would have to be what we received from the U.K., which you got a year ago, and that was from Mr. Johnny Webb. What it was was he was taking a photograph in Germany on a trip from England, and he was looking at the spire of the church. As he was looking up... He took photographs because it was beautiful. When he got home and he was going through the photos, he saw a metallic dome-shaped disc with portholes and windows that at least they looked like that on the craft. He thought that was amazing. Now, backtrack. Before he took those photographs, or right around the time he took those photographs, he was on tour. And when he was on tour, that's when he saw the church, so he went inside the church. Inside the church, there were photographs of the church that, because it survived the bombings, from World War II. There was a photograph from 1945, and in almost the exact same position, you see an anomalous object that actually looks disc-shaped. And the fact that you get to see both of these photographs in the Third Phase of Moon book is amazing. And people are... I think that that's just history repeating itself right there. So those are my top two, Blake. Dr. Dan Elias, I really want to thank you for uh, joining us right here at Third Phase. No problem, Blake. Let's just remind all the viewers and listeners about the other radio show, Dr. Greer, this Thursday, May 30th, on freedomslips.com, 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Again, freedomslips.com, S-L-I-P-S.com, Dr. Greer. Dr. Greer, yeah, that's going to always good to have Dr. Greer on board, and I look forward to that show. Everybody, uh, freedomslips.com. We'll be uh, posting it here at Third Phase, but be sure to check it out on uh, freedomslips.com live. On, and I'll be on the show as well, joining the show, and it's going to be a lot of fun. Thanks again, Dr. Dan Elias. Anytime, Blake. All right. You know, if anybody out there's captured anything amazing in regards to UFOs, we sure would like to see it. And the best way to contact us is Third the Moon via Skype. So you keep your eyes on the skies. My name's Blake Cousins. We'll see you again next time.